So today I'm going to talk about building plugin-free, almost plugin-free video chat and browser. First of all, um, just let me tell you a small story. Um, yesterday we had a speaker lunch and I spoke a lot there and, um, or was it dinner, something like that. So I'm kind of losing my voice, so bear with me. Um, yeah, so hi, my name is Mikhail, as I said, and I hope Google Translate actually translated correctly. And if it's not, blame Google Translate. But it looks reasonable to me. <laughs> so um, I speak Ukrainian, somehow similar, so yeah. Um, I live in Dresden, in Germany, and I work for Citrix there, and that's how it looks like. Not Citrix, but Dresden. And um, I cannot, I don't know what to say, you know, it's there. So let's talk about plugins instead. Um, and I mean native plugins, like C++ and this kind of stuff, and to be honest, I don't really like them. So, um, yeah, but I mean, it's powerful and, and cool, but still, I, I, I don't know, it's kind of it's something, you know, uh, not in the browser. I mean, you, you, you install it and it runs like a separate process, and uh, it's kind of feel insecure, and um, I kind of scared. By, by installing plugins. But there is like good old NP API. And um, yeah, NP API. And does anyone know what this logo means? Yeah, that's a couple of people. Yeah, that's Netscape. It was so long ago, right? NP stands for Netscape plugin. So NP API is Netscape plugin API. So um, that API itself. Um, even though it's like so powerful, it's still like, you know, from 90s or something. And um, it is like this guy, very powerful but very evil. It runs outside of sandbox. You can do a lot of amazing stuff with this, like running 3D games in the browser, like CryEngine, or if you played Quake ever, so like Quake Live, it was using API. API. But yeah, even Flash was somehow NPNPI-ish. And uh, the, the biggest problem with this is like it is not secure at all. So actually it runs outside of Zenbox as a standalone process and it can have full access to your file system and could, and can, could do some native, nasty stuff. So Adobe Flash. Flash was cool when you was a kid. But uh, whenever you grow up, you understand that, you know, Flash, it has some problems and performance issues, and uh, again, all the security stuff, and was, again, outside of Sandbox, even though Chrome put it in Sandbox. But still, I mean, it's kind of old way. So these guys also doesn't like plugins. Like, Microsoft doesn't like plugins in IE. Apple doesn't like plugins, in plugins on iOS. Google doesn't like plugins in Chrome browser. That's why they killed NP and NPI. And if you wonder why the color of this slide is different, is because Google logo looks bad on green, and Microsoft logo looks bad everywhere. <laughs> so HTML5 for the rescue. So with HTML5 and all these powerful uh, APIs, you can do crazy stuff in JavaScript. And uh, it's really awesome. So it's like opening up the door to a brave new world. And for example, like if you want to build, again, video uh, chat in the browser, then it's, uh, and someone invites you for a like, video conversation just one click away. You just click a link, and then it opens up your favorite browser, and bam, you are there. So as I said, I work for Citrix. And at Citrix, we love WebRTC. But what is WebRTC itself? WebRTC is new technology, relatively new technology, where RTC stands for real-time communication. So it, it is peer-to-peer -peer based, and it has media capabilities like audio, video, and screen capture, and also data capabilities. It's bidirectional data channel. Uh, I think security is very important. So most of the um, WebRTC stuff uh, or features, they run on or require HTTPS. 
and WebRTC has uh, support for DTLS, so your actual media which is flowing between peers is actually encrypted, and you can have optional encryption like PGP for your data messages if you, if you want. So what is peer-to-peer? So um, it's just like two participants talk talking to each other. And uh, I'm sorry for this slide because it looks pretty bad. And I use slides.com to, to prepare my presentations and like drawing capabilities that are, let's say, kind of limited. And um, so yeah, two peers talking to each other. It's, it's so cool, right? So there is no need for server. Uh, actually, it's not true you still need a signal relay because those peers need to somehow discover each other. Because can you imagine that you like, you both on different sides of Earth and want to talk to each other, so you need to find each other. So you need to have kind of a well-known third party which will um, introduce you to each other and yeah, basically let you do your handshake. So peer-to-peer -peer example is pretty clear, right? Um, not really. I mean, I'm sorry again for drawing, it's, it's really horrible, but uh, let's talk about three peers. So it's like three people talking to each other. It means that everyone is talking to everyone. So I need to talk to, or send my stream, like upstream to two other peers at the same time. So I, I need to talk, um, yeah, to, to send two streams and I need to receive two streams. And I need to negotiate with Sigma. And um, can you imagine now, if it would be five guys, how it would look like, or 15, or 100. So it's kind of tough, right? But there is a solution for this. It's called SFU, Selective Forwarding Viewing. So basically that's your kind of a, I don't know, uh, backend in between, which actually does all these, uh, uh, managing all the streams for you. So it means that you as a peer, if there is like four guys, example, you need to send just one stream to SFU. You don't need to send three streams instead. So actually it makes scaling way easier. And you still get the uh, yeah, downstreams, it's like n number of participants minus one. And on SFU, it opens uh, peers for you. So basically you're still sort of talking peer to peer. It's just two, two of you, SFU and you and you talk to each other, and it's like somehow magically gets distributed for the rest. So let's talk about available relays, and so like platforms and fr frameworks where you can get these SFUs, because yeah, it's a, it's a complicated thing, and it's building one yourself, it's kind of tough. So there is a bunch of them, and um, it's a bunch of open source and free solutions as well, like Jitsi, for example. Jitsi Video Bridge actually, um, yeah, provides SFU for you. Same with Skyling, OpenTalk. OpenTalk actually, you can get um, dev key for 30 days for free, but then, yeah, you need to check the pricing. And um, there is one from Twilio, from B3 Free Switch, is also like open source backend, uh, which, yeah, gives you WebRTC capabilities for SFU. And obviously, at Citrix, we also have one. It's not yet publicly available, though, but um, yeah, we're working on that. And PureJS is basically a framework which abstracts uh, you from WebRTC, same as um, simple, simple uh, WebRTC. It just makes everything easier. And is WebRTC actually ready for production? Like, is anyone using this? And apparently, yes. So obviously, go to me, because I work for Citrix and we actually do a lot of WebRTC there. Google Hangouts, they, last summer they fully switched to WebRTC. Um, Firefox Hello, yeah, they use OpenTalk as a backend, and uh, yeah, you can call from browser to browser. I think the main idea behind that is actually Firefox OS and kind of a FaceTime functionality. Um, Uber, you actually can call, uh, call your driver using WebRTC. Uber Conference, the, this one, the uh, blue one. Uh, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, as I said, um, appearing. Yeah, and there is a talky, awesome product by end yet. And web torrents, so even torrents are using peer-to-peer -peer technology. Obviously, it's torrents, so it's peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's using WebRTC to have torrents in, in browser. 
So it's ready to, to be used. And this page is provided by Andy. Others. And, uh, it's really great uh, overview of uh, can be used or not. And as you can see, Chrome actually supports a lot. There are some yellow bars, which means that they do not support like promise-based APIs and this kind of stuff from Web W3C spec, but they like slowly working on that. Firefox is doing really great there. Microsoft Edge sort of supports WebRTC. It's actually ORTC, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, Safari, yeah, Safari is modern IE8. They don't support anything. And <laughs> um, so WebRTC is not just for a browser. I mean, you can get this kind of impression because I talk about meanings in the browser and like showing browser support all the time. But actually, the WebRTC org itself, it's, uh, there is a C++ library you can use for native. And uh, you can cover like different use cases. You can have like browser talking to browser. You can have Internet of Things like I don't know replacement for IB accounts and to have like data channel. You can yeah obviously uh, browser on mobile like Chrome uh, on Android talking to browser on desktop or to uh, IoT powered device whatever TV or a fridge I don't know. So what is inside WebRTC? Um, WebRTC is like a bunch of APIs and proven protocols and methods inside. So um, it has um, device handling and engines. It has codec implementations. It has media transport layer. And yeah, it has reliable bidirectional real-time uh, data channels. So WebRTC media transport contains RTP, RTCP, and stun multiplexed into one connection. RTP is... Uh, for uh, transferring your media, RTCP to get feedback, like uh, picture loss indications. So for example, if like you have a packet loss or something, it can do some retranspections and, and this kind of stuff. And you have stun to poke uh, holes in firewalls and uh, nets, because obviously not every user is like having public IP address and, and such, especially in corporate environment where the most of our customers are, at least our as Citrix. Um, Typical WebRTC flow is, it is some SDP and a lot of asynchronous stuff. It is a bidirectional handshake. So someone sends an offer, other part needs to respond, uh, respond with, with an answer. And so you need to gather IP candidates uh, to actually connect to peers. And um, yeah, you can establish media connection asynchronously from signaling. So that's an illustration of STAN and turn servers. So um, STAN is actually used to uh, obtain public IP address, which can be used to, to connect to peers if you like behind that. And if it's not possible, if there is no possible way to connect to peers, you can use turn server, which is full media relay. In this case, all the media you transfer will go through a uh, turn server. So say hi to NSA. Uh, WebRTC offers an answers. Usually SDP looks like that. It's like text-based uh, protocol where, which contains information about codecs and streams. But as a JavaScript developer, you actually don't need to deal with this. From time to time, you can actually see this and like tweak a little bit, but uh, it's just an example. So actually, it's like abstracted a lot in JavaScript. So don't be scared by that. Let's talk about APIs. I love APIs. At Citrix, my main duty is actually build APIs. So I build um, JavaScript library on top of WebRTC, which uh, powers go to me, a web client, to actually transfer audio and video. And uh, on most of the slides, I will use WebKit prefix and uh, yeah, show examples for Chrome, but just feel free to replace it with most prefix, and it's going to work for Firefox too. Get user media. Um, I don't know, have you been to a talk? Um, about the like video messages uh, left in chat in like early this morning, and um, I really like it. And actually, it's powered using get user media. So, but get user media is your API to get the stream from your camera or microphone and do some stuff with this. So, um, on this slide, like I don't know how pointer works. Where can I? Oh yeah, cool. There's 
someone has a cat? No? Okay. So <laughs> this one is kind of old API, which is, uh, um, it works perfectly in Chrome and um, in current stable Chrome as well. And basically you say on Navigator, you have WebKit get user media and you say, I want to get audio and video, you just have, uh, say true. And you get one stream which actually contains two, uh, two tracks, one for audio and one for video. And to show it on the web page, all you need to do is to call, uh, to call URL, create object URL from a stream and you get just string like these, which just looks like URL. And then you just put it in your video uh, element in the C tag and you just see immediately what is captured from your camera. That's, uh, I mean, you can, uh, you have to pass the error callback as well. And um, that's uh, how current Canary, Firefox and Edge looks like. Um, and that's promise-based API. In my opinion, it's more handy. So you got this new media devices object and you call this user media without any prefixes. You do pretty much the same and returns a promise. And then, yeah, you attach whenever you want ban banables and then you can catch some, some errors. Yes, I said, uh, because user media tri triggers um, user to uh, grant access to uh, microphone and camera. So it's like kind of a small bar uh, behind the address bar uh, saying, hey, um, this page wants to use your camera. Do you allow or deny? And um, if you ask for both audio and video at the same time, it's just one dialogue. If you do two separate user media calls and uh, ask in one for audio and another one for video, it's going to be two different dialogues. And if you use HTTP, then um, whenever you call get user media, it's going to bug your user to, to grant the uh, access to camera and uh, microphone. And, um, but if you use HTTPS, then yeah, it's, it's persisted. So whenever user allows access, it's going to be saved. And next time user returns to that page, uh, you can get access to the, uh, his camera and, and microphone immediately. Um, let's talk about media stream API. So when you get a stream, what you can do with this? Uh, you can get all the audio tracks if you ask for a combined uh, constraints like audio and video, uh, as I showed in slides. So to get the real audio track, if you want to do something uh, like post-processing in web audio, you just call uh, get audio tracks and you get a track object, which actually, yeah, can be used for um, yeah, web audio or something. You can enable or disable it. If you say enable false, you basically mute uh, the track without calling mute on the audio element. So from JavaScript, you can control it um, from API. Uh, same for video. You can clone streams if you want to do some modifications, I know, apply some fillers or, or something like that. And um, to stop the stream completely, you, you basically iterate over the, uh, all, all tracks and call stop on every track. And you need to stop it to actually get rid of uh, this green dot next to your camera um, if you don't need that stream anymore. As I said, it has device management built in. So, um, yeah, you can enumerate and get the list of input devices uh, or output devices you have on your laptop or your computer. So if you use several headsets, for example, so you actually can switch between microphones or like you can have built-in microphone or one in uh, your headset. Same with cameras. If you have several cameras, then basically, um, yeah, you're gonna list them all. And um, uh, object you get when you actually uh, called get sources and, and, and get devices. It's an array of objects, and object looks like that. It's facing means uh, for mobile. It's is it either it's like facing camera on on or on the back, and um, ID. This is generated device ID, and it says what kind of it is. It video for camera or, or uh, audio for for a microphone, and if it says video output or actually for, there is no video output, but audio output, it means like speakers, I don't know, airplay speakers or your building speakers or something like that. And the label is the name of of device basically. In this case, it's some Logitech uh, webcam, and that's uh, how new API looks like. So pretty much the same. It just returns a promise and just more handy to to deal with this. Uh, how do you like select a device? You, you got a list of devices and you want to tell your get user media which device to use. So um, in previous example, we just had audio true, 
But in this one, we actually have as an object, and we have the optional uh, array of objects, uh, constraints, and we have source ID. This ID, so this is basically this one. I mean, it doesn't match because it's a different device, apparently, but yeah, it should be that one. Um, you also can limit the uh, or manipulate the video dimensions you get from um, get user media because um, for some reasons if your bandwidth not optimal you can just lower it down or actually increase and say hey I transmit full uh, full HD video and yeah basically here you say minimum width and height and maximum width and height and you also can uh, specify frame rate and uh, this kind of stuff. As I said, you also can do screen sharing. And screen sharing in WebRTC is just an, yet another video stream. But to capture that video stream in order to actually have an additional layer of security without like, you know, um, spying on the user and capturing his screen, uh, obviously you need to ask for permission Plus, you need to ask what user actually want to share. Maybe he doesn't want to share at all, or he wants to share just a window or a whole desktop. So for that, you need browser extension or add-on, not a plugin. So it's JavaScript uh, extension, and uh, uh, Chrome has this uh, desktop cap capture API, and basically you s ask what kind of permissions you're going to ask, and uh, it returns a stream ID here. And that stream ID you, you, you're gonna pass here. And so basically you're saying, hey, capture, it's like input device, just a bit different uh, syntax. You, you basically say, hey, please capture this stream from this device. And let's talk about peer connection now. Because at the very beginning I was showing these different peers and now I was talking a lot about cameras and stuff. So that's basically your transport. You, you have API in JavaScript to create uh, a peer and then I mentioned earlier uh, turn and stun service. So basically you provide them here and basically say, hey, use these servers if you cannot uh, find the uh, direct route. And you can say, yeah, I don't like IP6. And uh, you also can say, hey, please enable um, encryption in my in my media. Um, RTP uh, or R RTC peer connection, uh, yeah, as I said, is your transport in browser and between two peers or not just in browser, just between two peers. And um, it contains own signaling, but this one for stun things, this one for actually poke uh, holes in, uh, in, in uh, nuts and then keep them open. Uh, but to do initial handshake, that discovery between peers, um, yeah, you need that well-known third party, right? And there are some backends you actually can use. Uh, first of all, there is one provided with peer, uh, peer JS. Whenever you use that framework, it has not JS implementation, so actually it can um, uh, be your like signaling third party. And there are some some servers like PubNub or Firebase, and um, yeah, you basically can use them. At, you can use whatever WebSocket, uh, Powered API, and uh, or HTTP. And speaking of WebSockets, probably all of you know Socket IO library, and uh, they recently released the feature. Uh, I don't know how it's called. I think it's like Socket P2P, which basically allows you to have peer-to-peer -peer WebSocket connection as well. So they basically do handshake for you and then establish direct peer-to-peer -peer connection. Um, whenever you capture a stream, you need to somehow plug it in into peer connection because otherwise it's like two different objects. They need to know about each other, right? And there is a, a good API for this and pretty straightforward. It's add stream to add stream, remove stream to do this. And um, these callbacks are uh, fired whenever other peer does the same, adds or removes the stream. And, when, and uh, if you modify peer connection by adding or removing the stream, there is a on, uh, on negotiation needed callback which is saying, hey, please redo your handshake because we need to let other peer know that we added something or removed. Data channel. 
It's very similar to WebSockets API. So basically, you create a data channel, you give a channel name, and you, want, uh, you, you, you say, like, do you want retransmission or not? Do you want a guaranteed order or not? And then you have uh, uh, yeah, on open, which basically your fires whenever, whenever the data channel is open, and yeah, in this case, it's going to send hi to an expert, and you have on message, on error, and on close. So if you have worked with WebSockets, especially with native implementation in JavaScript, that should look very familiar to you. ICE candidates. What is ICE? ICE is uh, interactive uh, connection establishment. So that's actually the protocol used to, to establish connection between two peers. And um, ICE candidate is like text-based or like lines, like a stream, which actually contains your IP address, port open, your protocol, UDP or TCP, and um, what kind of candidate it is. So is it like local direct uh, connection is possible or through stun or through turn? So basically, WebRTC asynchronously con uh, collects all the um, ICE candidates whenever you, you call create offer, and it uh, gets all the possible routes you can get to the connection. And uh, once connection is established, WebRTC is probing um, all the ICE candidates pairs, and uh, it chooses the one with uh, the least round trip time and uh, uses that one. And it, do it, uh, and it does it frequently. So uh, if, for whatever reason, your connection got better through another path, it's going to switch behind the scenes, and you're not going to notice that, but it's going to improve the, the connectivity. So, um, API is pretty simple. You have a callback, you register, and you get the candidate. And this is an object with, with some, some data, and, and candidate itself is um, that string I was talking about. And if it's empty, then it means that it was the last candidate. So, whenever you go uh, get, get these candidates, you need to exchange them uh, with remote peer. And for this, you can, uh, again, use your signal channel, like, like Firebase or something, the, the same one you use for uh, doing initial handshake. And whenever you get um, a message, like candidate, like remote candidate from a second peer, you need to apply it by calling at ice candidate. And uh, yeah, so WebRTC knows about that candidate. Um, earlier, I mentioned security. and also, I told that WebRTC will collect all possible ways to connect, which means it will collect a lot of IP addresses. And it can actually collect your like private IP addresses, and uh, maybe you don't want to somehow expose them. So uh, Google implemented the way that you can actually tell WebRTC what kind of candidates to, uh, to collect, like all of them, or just stun candidates with public IP address, or like turn candidates saying, hey, I want to use relay only. So um, yeah, for example, um, on the web, some, some of the web pages, uh, they have trackers, right? And those trackers might collect some um, IP addresses as well. And before that, or even now, if web pages use WebRTC, it can create peer connection without uh, any streams because data channel, you can create a peer connection with data channel only. So um, it will not, not ask user about any permission, but it will start gathering ICE candidates, uh, which means that it can collect all the information about your network topology and send it some, somewhere behind the scenes. So I guess if you like really sensitive about this, you need to keep an eye on, on WebRTC. You can do evil stuff. I was talking a lot about offers and handshakes. So um, yeah, the, one of the peers has to send an offer saying, hey, I have a video or data and want to send. So what you do in this case is, um, yeah, you create peer connection and you call create on offer. It's asynchronous and it gives you offer, which uh, looks like that SDP I showed at the very beginning. And when you create an offer, you can say, what do you actually want? You want to have, like receive video or, or audio. And once you created an offer, you actually need to save it as a local description and say, hey, yeah, I know that I am created this offer. 
and then you send that offer to a second peer. Um, once a second peer receives that offer, it applies it as a remote description and creates an answer in, back, uh, uh, in response uh, and, other, and, and, and set local description. Um, so it has already like offer and answer on one end and can send back the answer. Yeah, once answer is received, you basically set remote description and um, you're pretty much good because handshake just happened. As I said, WebRTC has um, signaling states, like it's two different um, uh, connections. Why, one is a um, signaling connection where all the uh, stun pings are happening and you poke uh, holes in that and, and keep them open. And one is for ice when you actually know that media is established. Um, yeah, there are two callbacks on signal state change and light connection state change. And um, uh, you can actually track the changes in, um, in states uh, and, and see what WebRTC is actually doing. Once signaling uh, turns to stable, it means that there is a st stable signaling connection and uh, yeah, it can exchange all the pings. And once ice uh, connection uh, uh, turns to, to connected, it means that now two peers are actually connected. So, yeah. And you have two, two peers connected. You can transfer data and do whatever you like. Um, debugging this can be pretty tough. And uh, there are built-in uh, tools for this. And uh, one for Chrome called like Chrome WebRTC internals is going to show you all the necessary information about WebRTC. Connection states, uh, streams, uh, all these uh, candidates, how peers are connected. It's going to show you round trip times, input output levels, and all, all that. Um, also, there is an export button. Whenever you click it, you get like a text file, which actually contains JSON file, and um, it contains all this data, and it's hard to read. So one guy built this awesome tool called WebRTC's Dump Importer, where you actually can import that dump and uh, see Chrome-like interface, which highlights the um, key uh, steps in your uh, WebRTC handshake and, uh, yeah, helps you to debug a lot. Also, there is a showcase called appsspot.com, which is uh, built by Google and some third parties who contribute there. So basically, it's a showcase of the, what WebRTC can do. And you can like look around and see what's possible. And it uses adapter GS. That's a JavaScript library they built to actually abstract some of the browser's differences. And um, yeah, there is a testwebrtc.org, which is um, a testing uh, tool which allows you to test, like, do you have access to microphone? Is your bandwidth is enough to, to send video? What kind of resolution you can capture from video? And um, can you actually connect uh, different peers? So use case examples. As I said, we um, do meetings. So that's how our GoToMeeting Pro looks. So basically, um, here you have like video streams, list of attendees, it's, um, yeah, audio is on, video is on. You can do some chat, and that's actually screen sharing. So some of the guys streaming his Windows computer with, with presentation. So what's next? WebRTC is, uh, has 1.0 version, but it's still a draft. It's not an official spec, and um, as you saw earlier, it doesn't support all of the um, browsers, so, or all browsers doesn't support WebRTC. It actively de developed, and it, it isn't uh, evolving, but it actually took quite a while to, to, to get it into browsers. So the history of WebRTC was that Google um, acquired a couple of companies like back in 2004, and uh, it was keep acquiring companies till 2010. And that was the first version when they launched the WebRTC.org and started to work on it. So for them, it took actually quite some time, like really up to four years to release the uh, open source, like fully fledged WebRTC version. 
Edge. That's a new um, browser, which yeah, recently released with Windows 10. And um, as I said, it's not going to support WebRTC, but ORTC. There are reasons for that. Uh, WebRTC does a lot of assumptions for you and does a lot of decision making. And some of the developers get frustrated about that. And then want better API and they want more control. So a um, working group uh, for the WebRTC um, and uh, removed a lot of proprietary stuff from Google or like VP8, VP9 and this kind of stuff and um, refactored API but keep the transport layer. So uh, ORTC and WebRTC, they compatible on transport layer. So if you have an Edge user sending a video to you, you should be able to receive it in uh, Chrome using WebRTC and actually play it back. So Google looked into ORTC specification and actually found it useful. And uh, they actually made an agreement that eventually they're going to converge. So Google already started to work on uh, changes and pull some, some changes from ORTC and implement it in WebRTC. So it's already happening in a project called WebRTC NV, which is, stands for next version, and uh, who knows when, but those are going to be one. And what about IE, you asked me, or Safari? So we have this IE 9.11, even though 9.11 sounds kind of, you know, uh, Shady, but that's also IE doesn't really sound good. So, so IE from 9 to 11 uh, doesn't have WebRTC uh, support. And there is a plugin by Tamasis. It's ActiveX NP API WebRTC plugin. So you probably now get the almost part, right? Um, you can install that plugin, and actually it's... Um, yeah, native plugin, and it provides WebRTC functionality, Chrome-like, uh, in um, IE and, and Safari. So uh, having Firefox, um, Chrome, IE, Safari, powered by plugin, and Edge, you pretty much get the nice coverage, and you can uh, have inter interoperability. So thanks a lot. Uh, it was a pleasure. I'm really excited to be here, and thanks for inviting me. And yeah, do you have any questions? So just raise your hand, and like I'll come there. Hey, hi. Um, what's the support on mobile browsers? Uh, yeah, so um, Android on mobile supports that iOS doesn't, um, because again, it's Safari engine everywhere, right? And uh, it, even Chrome on iOS using Safari engine to render stuff. Um, there is a project by Google actually the, to bring WebRTC to iOS, and that's a big focus for them now, and they want to have mobile support, so they work on it, but um, it's hard to say will Apple actually accept pull requests to, to WebKit or not. Um, Native, uh, natively you can have uh, obviously C++, Objective-C, Swift, and then you can actually use WebRTC. Uh, at Citrix, we have a native app for GoToMe, and actually it is WebRTC powered uh, there, so uh, we have a native libraries for this. I also saw um, some kind of a plugin, it's also native plugin for Cordova, so if you build like hybrid applications, so I haven't tried it myself, but theoretically you can get um, WebRTC running there as well. Hello, uh, I just wonder uh, what kind of compression is used for video and audio. Uh, I know Google uses VP9 mm -hmm. now, but I don't know, uh, is it supported on other platforms like uh, Internet Explorer or Firefox and other? Yeah, actually, it's a very good question, and uh, as well as previous. So. <laughs> um, yeah, Google has own codec, right? VP8, VP9, and then uh, there was like a huge discussion about uh, should H.264 be supported or not, and actually, the decision was that yes, both of the codecs should be supported. So Google will work on it, but they treat it as a second-level citizen. In uh, Edge, it's other way around. 
They said they were going to support H.264, and we're actually going to work on GP8.9 as well, but it's going to happen later. So eventually, both of the browsers will be able to talk um, to each other and negotiate the codex, but at the moment, you actually have to transcode. Uh, for example, at um, Citrix, uh, backend we're building actually does transcoding from uh, H.264 to VP9 and back. We have time for more questions. Actually, I was afraid that no one will ask questions and that it will be awkward, so actually I put this slide so I can leave it on <laughs> to, uh, just for, to fill up the time for the rest. So. Is this streamed right now? <laughs> it's not WebRTC powered. 